Okay, let's talk a little bit about reptiles. So this is still chapter 17. And uh, chapter 17, the ectothermic vertebrates, again, animals with backbones that are cold-blooded. And chapter 17, part D, class reptilia, also known as the reptiles. So first, some of the key characteristics of reptiles. First of all, we have skin covered with scales, right? A little bit similar to fish in this sense, so a little bit different in the structure and nature of their scales. But yeah, skin covered with scales. And then next we have an amniotic egg with a leathery shell. And um, so a little bit about the amniotic egg. Some of the main structures of an amniotic egg. First, there is the protective yet porous leathery shell. So it's a you know outer boundary that both serves as a good way of protecting the developing embryo inside, but it's also poor, so it allows gases to exchange in and out. All right. And then next we have an embryo in a fluid-filled amniotic sac. So inside the egg, one part of the inside of the egg is the developing embryo, and it's in a, a kind of a watery sac. Uh, it's amniotic fluid that is inside the sac, and the boundary of that sac is called the amnion. So that's where we, we get the amniotic egg from the amniotic fluid that has the embryo inside and the amnion membrane that surrounds that little sac. But then the other part of the egg is the yolk, and the yolk provides the nutrition for the embryo. So those are the main parts. There are a couple other um, membrane names that we could go over, but that gives you a, a pretty good little idea of the main parts of an amniotic egg. And there are some distinct similarities to, um, to humans from the standpoint of there's amniotic fluid and humans developing inside the womb as well. And then some similarities to bird's eggs, right? Because you're used to thinking of like, well, the yolk of an egg, that's also part of bird's eggs as well. All right, so we have skin covered in scales, amniotic egg with a leathery shell, and then respiration via lungs with alveoli. Uh, those are thin, air-filled sacs. So we have lungs that are starting to look a little bit more similar to human lungs here as well. So they breathe via lungs, and then they have circulation via a three-ish chambered heart. And I say three-ish chambered heart because it's technically a three-chambered heart, but there is a partial wall that separates the one big chamber into almost two separate chambers. And for that to make a little bit more sense, I have a picture here. We'll go over heart structure a little bit more when we look at mammal hearts and, and human hearts. But fish, they just kind of have one chamber here that pumps blood throughout the body. Amphibians, they have a true three-chambered heart. So the gist of what's going on here is this tube here would be receiving blood from the rest of the body, right? This would be a, the, the main vein that is receiving blood from the rest of the body. And then this right here would be receiving blood from the lungs. So lung is coming into the heart from the rest of the body there. Here, blood is coming into the heart from the lungs. Now with, a, with amphibians, from these two upper chambers, the blood gets pumped into this lower chamber, but it just kind of mixes there. And then from this lower chamber, it gets pumped out of these two. And so it's like this one would go out to the body, and then this one would go out to the lungs. So here's like blood would go out to the lungs, comes back in from the lungs, flows through here, and then out here where it might go out to the body, it might go out to the lungs. Similarly, blood comes in from the rest of the body. It's lost most of its oxygen at that point. Comes in from the rest of the body, gets pumped into this chamber, and from this chamber it goes, it goes out where it might go out to the body, it might go out to the lungs. Whereas reptiles, they have this partial wall here, and it just keeps this blood here from mixing as much. Because what you have going on here is the more reddish stuff would be like blood that has um, oxi more oxygen in it, as we would say is oxygenated blood. Because it comes in from the lungs, where it's just picked up oxygen, gets pumped into there, 
And then from there, it would get pumped out to the rest of the body. Then as it's out in the rest of the body, the body is using, absorbing and using most of the oxygen. So it's now deoxygenated coming into the heart here. And then it gets pumped into this chamber. And then from this chamber, it gets pumped out to the lungs where it picks up oxygen and comes back to the heart to get pumped out to the rest of the body. So it's technically a three-chambered heart. We have one, two, three, but this third chamber here is partially divided. And that's why I say three-ish. Birds and mammals have true four-chambered hearts, and we'll look at that later. All right, senses of reptiles, reptile senses. So sight varies greatly. You have some reptiles that have great sight, some that have very poor sight, some that are even blind. Uh, there's this species of snake, for example, that kind of looks like a large earthworm, but it's technically a snake, and it's blind. Um, interesting other little tidbit about that species of snake is they only have females, and they don't need sperm in order to reproduce. And so the females just produce eggs that produce clones of themselves. And sometimes the clones only have one set of chromosomes, they're haploid. Some, sometimes the eggs form into diploid organisms that have both sets of chromosomes, and they just reproduce completely via females. There are no males to that species. Anyway, sight varies greatly. Hearing, generally poor. One of the reasons is... Um, is at least with snakes, uh, I'm trying to remember other reptile groups, but they don't have external openings to their ears, and that just limits their hearing to being, yeah, they, they can hear a bit, but not great. But then smell and taste is especially where they are really great. And this is partially because of something called the Jacobson's organ. The Jacobson's organ allows the... the reptiles to, in a sense, to taste the air, but it's it's a mixing of the senses of taste and smell, which is similar to what we do. We When we smell, when we taste things, well, our, our sense of smell and taste kind of overlap with each other a little bit. It's one of the reasons why some people, if they're having to eat something that they don't like, they plug their nose. And the reason why is because it dampens the sense of taste because it's getting rid of some of the sense of smell that we experience. But the, uh, yeah, reptiles, their Jacobson's organs are kind of uh, up above the roof of their mouth. And so if you picture like a lizard or a snake sticking its tongue out and then bringing it back in, the main thing that the reptile is doing there is when it sticks its tongue out, it grabs air molecules. Air molecules stick to it or get kind of trapped on the tongue. And then the snake, I'll just go with the snake here, withdraws its tongue back into its mouth, bringing air molecules with it that then the Jacobson's organs sense, in a sense, kind of taste slash smell the air molecules, and it can tell a lot about what's going on uh, based on its sense of smell or taste. And with that, let's do question number four of your video questions. Question number four is, the forked tongue of a snake allows it to do what? The forked, so if you picture a snake tongue it is one thing out toward its tip, and then it forks or splits into two separate parts. So the forked tongue of a snake allows it to do what? And the answer is smell in stereo. Smell in stereo. And what we mean by that is it's similar to our sense of hearing. We can tell what direction a sound came from because we have two ears, and our brains are able to sense the difference in volume in what our two ears heard and the difference in timing of what our two ears heard and is able to compute based on, it's like, oh, based on the fact that the left ear heard something louder than the right ear did and heard it slightly before the right ear did, the sound that I heard came from the left. Well, our sense of smell is not able to do that. We just can smell something. We can't tell what direction a smell came from. But the forked tongue of a snake allows it to bring in and, and identify, oh, I am smelling something stronger from the left 
tip of the tongue than the right tip of the tongue. Therefore, the thing that I am smelling is over toward the left. And so it's able to, as it were, smell in stereo. Uh, and then finally, one other sense that some reptiles have is heat sensitivity. And uh, a good example there would be pit vipers. Pit vipers have these like rows of sensory things along the sides of their head and allows them to sense body heat. And so even if it's totally dark, pitch black, they can use that sense to identify prey. And I think it's something like they can sense something like one thousandth of a degree change in their surroundings to be able to sense, aha, I am sensing the body heat of prey over here. And based on the amount of body heat that I am sensing, here's approximately the size of the living thing that I can go hunt and try to kill. Interesting little tidbit that I forgot to cover with sharks along this line is there were some scientists doing some studying with some sharks and there were, um, you know, like the video that we watched of the flounder, uh, flounder, yeah, that was super well camouflaged on that drum and then went over to a different spot. Well, some marine biologists were doing study with sharks and there were prey down at the bottom that were totally camouflaged. And they knew that sharks' eyesight is not that great, but these sharks somehow would dive down right where the prey was and would capture and, and eat the prey. And at first the biologists like, how are these sharks able to figure out or able to sense or able to find where these smaller fish are that they're eating? And after further study, what they found is that sharks have an ability to sense basically magnetic fields or electromagnetic waves that are put out by minute electrical impulses from muscle activity. And uh, it would be the equivalent of, uh, I've read that it would be the equivalent of if you had a device that could sense a 9-volt battery being used in uh, some electronic device two miles away. That's about the level of sensitivity that sharks have for being able to sense the magnetic activity produced by the electrical impulses produced by muscle activity inside other animals. Anyway, I, I think that's pretty cool and pretty fascinating and um, didn't cover it when we talked about sharks, so I thought I would toss it in there. All right, that's a little bit about reptile senses. Moving on. So orders of reptiles. The first order that we have is order Squamata, and this is the snakes and lizards. So one of the things about this order that characterizes it is a what's called a disarticulating lower jaw. And, and this basically means that um, the snakes and lizards can essentially dislocate or unhinge their lower jaw to make it so that they can, or disconnect their lower jaw to make it so that they can open their lower jaw super widely. And that largely comes in handy for the snakes that swallow their prey hole, which most, if not all snakes can do that. They swallow their prey hole. Uh, and then sometimes venomous. Um, yeah, approximately 6,600 species. And one of the things that the text goes over a little bit are the four different ways that snakes move, or we can say these are four different modes of snake movement. And the first is the probably the main one that you would think of. It's serpentine movement. And this is winding across the ground in a series of S curves. So this is kind of the snake just winding back and forth, and that's this way of moving forward. But then another kind is called concertina, and what it does here is it draws its body into a really tight, or at least moderately tight, S shape. And then it extends its front half forward, and then it pulls its back half into a tight S and extends its top half forward, or front half forward. And this is usually used when the snake is between two different structures. I, the next slide, I have a picture that demonstrates some of these. And then the slide after that, I have a video of a snake doing some sidewinding. 
Uh, and then third, there's rectilinear. Rectilinear. And this is using scoots. Scoots are specialized, um, are specialized scales on the belly or the underside or the ventral side of a snake. And the snakes are able to control the scoots with muscular activity. And they can control the scoots in such a way that the snake basically just glides straight forward. So here we have using scoots to pull itself forward in a straight line. And then finally, sidewinding. And this is this could be described as shuffling sideways by looping its body forward, keeping contact with the ground at only two to three points. And this is oftentimes used for snakes that are out in the desert where the ground is really hot and because of snakes being cold-blooded, cold-blooded, or in other words, not able to regulate their own body temperature. They need to be careful about not overheating, and they can do that by only contacting the ground in a couple points and the rest of their body being above the ground so that subtle breezes that are blowing along the surface of the earth can help cool or dissipate heat from the rest of its body. So some pictures of what that can look like. Concertina, that's the tightening itself up and then extending itself. Serpentine, that's this regular snake kind of movement that you would probably think of. Sidewinding, you can kind of see what's going on there. The next video will help explain that a little bit. And then um, caterpillar or rectilinear, using its scoots to kind of inch forward in a straight line. All right, let's check out this. The Sidewinder's every move is about combating the desert's relentless heat. Side-to-side -side motion allows the snake to move using a minimum of energy. It also reduces contact between the Sidewinder's body and the scorching sand. Only two short pieces of its body touch the ground at any one time. Like many desert animals, the Sidewinder's nocturnal in the heat of summer. Only coming out when the temperatures are at their lowest. But this snake's most remarkable adaptation is the fact that it can survive without a single drop of water. Getting all it needs from its prey. Yeah, so I find that video really helpful for being able to, like, you know, picture what's going on with sidewinding. It's a really cool form of movement. Uh, speaking of not getting its prey like that, let's see. A lot of snakes will take anywhere from one to three days to digest the food that they've eaten, and then that has them set for a good little while. All right, what else do we have here? Let's see. Uh, ways the snakes kill their prey. Some of them swallow it whole. That'd be like anacondas, for example. Um, or anacondas. Yeah, yeah. There was a guy, let's see, I forget his name. This was about four years ago. He was trying to do a documentary where he would be filmed and he would do filming himself of himself getting eaten whole by an anaconda. He was wearing some kind of a protective suit that would protect him from you know, like digestive juices and from getting pierced by any fangs or anything like that. And uh, a camera, and I forget what else. And he actually went a ways toward being swallowed whole by the anaconda. But he called it off, and he had people help like open the snake's mouth and pull him out when he felt like the pressure from inside the snake was possibly breaking his arm. And it's like, <laughs> that is quite a length to go for the sake of a documentary. All right, so some snakes kill their prey by swallowing it whole, and then the prey dies inside the snake. Some uh, do suffocation by constriction. That'd be like a boa constrictor, for example, where they coil their body around their prey and then suffocate their prey, and then they swallow it whole. And then others kill with poison. And yeah, so bite their prey, inject poison. 
Uh, a lot, oftentimes the poisonous fangs that snakes have are retractable. So they're like horizontal in the roof of their mouth. And then when they open their mouth to, uh, to attack, the fangs are like on a hinge and they snap into a vertical position and are able to inject the poison like that. Let's see. All right, how about... Video question number three. Video question number three. Name a country that does not have any indigenous snakes. So no snakes that are native to that country. And the main one that some people would be familiar with is Ireland. Ireland does not have any native snakes. Uh, nor do they have any native mosquitoes. It's really nice from that standpoint. No snakes, no mosquitoes. And legend has it that... that um, St. Patrick chased that the Ireland used to have snakes and until St. Patrick came along and he chased all the snakes away. But you know, there's no historical anything to that, but yeah. Anyway, so Ireland, um, Iceland and New Zealand are the two other countries that do not have any indigenous snakes, but for the sake of number three here, just Ireland is good. All right. Next little bullet point there. Lizards versus snakes. So what are some of the differences between lizards and snakes? Well, most obvious, probably, usually two pair of limbs versus no limbs. Lizards have four legs. Snakes don't have any. Uh, next, external ear openings. That's right. I was, I, earlier, I was like, I, I, I do feel like there are some reptiles that do have external ear openings. Yeah, external ear openings that lizards have versus no external ear openings for snakes. So you would assume correctly that lizards in general have a better sense of hearing than snakes do. And then next, eyelids and can close eyes. So in other words, lizards have eyelids and lizards can close their eyes versus with snakes, their eyes are permanently open. And then finally, the for lizards, belly covered in scales that are similar to the rest of the body versus snakes have those specialized scoots the the uh, scales on their bellies that they're able to use for movement. Okay. Speaking of lizards, one lizard organ organism is the Komodo dragon. So a little video about the Komodo dragon. Something special is happening at the Denver Zoo. After eight months in an incubator, eggs are hatching. And these rare baby Komodo dragons are getting their first glimpse of the world. Working with an animal like this that has very rarely been bred in captivity, and so little is known about them that everything that we do is such a learning process that makes it very exciting for us. Komodo dragons are notoriously difficult to breed in captivity. Hatching these rare reptiles takes time and patience. It's hard to believe but when fully grown, these tiny baby dragons turn into adult Komodos that weigh more than 150 pounds and can live for over 30 years. That's a big lizard. There may be fewer than 5,000 of these ancient creatures in the wild, living on small islands in Indonesia. With small populations like the Komodo dragon, it's important for us to learn as much as we can about not only keeping them alive, but reproducing them and raising the young. And by uh, keeping animals and breeding them, we learned a lot that a lot of times you can't learn from uh, field biology. While staff check the incubators for oh, new right. hatchlings, the adult dragons are examined closely by their handlers. This is Castor the dragon. He's a very curious dragon. He's just very friendly, as you can see. He likes to be pet. He'll shut his eyes when I rub him near the head. The captive Komodos seem gentle, but handlers know better. Adult dragons have a nasty bite. She's coming. Wild Komodos will eat just about anything. These zoo dragons feast on a diet consisting of fish and rats. The baby Komodos will live in a nursery for now and move to a much larger exhibit as they grow. Anytime we raise babies from almost this size to adulthood to the point where they're breeding, means to us that we're doing a good job. These baby dragons are a small miracle, 
and proof that some creatures truly are born to be wild. And then this next one is about flying amphibians and reptiles. The golden tree frog of Malaysia is a treetop acrobat. Usually it hops just a few meters. But if it meets a golden tree snake, it happily makes a leap into the unknown. As it plummets, spread limbs slow its descent and its webbed feet double up as a parachute. The javan flying frog goes one better. Its webbed feet have evolved into miniature wings. Instead of parachuting, it paraglides at an angle. But it's the Wallace frog that achieves aeronautical perfection. Its huge webbed feet become aerofoils that slow and control its descent. It glides as far forward as the distance it falls. As well as winged feet, its whole body is aerodynamically shaped. Lizards lack webbed feet, so they expand other body features to get their wings. The flying gecko's impressive glide angle is due to wing-like fringes on its body. Every available edge has an aerodynamic extension. But it's the Draco lizard whose design really flies. A huge aerofoil turns the Draco into a living frisbee, while its tail steers like a rudder. Foldable ribs act as support struts to create the perfect wing. The golden tree snake uses other aeronautical tricks for its leap of faith. It loops its body for the ultimate takeoff and projects forward to gain a head start. It then flattens into a ribbon and swims through the air using S-shaped waves of its body. The star of this jungle air show is the owner of the most extravagant wings. From 80 meters up, the Wallace frog glides 80 meters forward. The gecko soars 100 meters. But nothing beats the flying frisbee. The Draco reaches a full 200 meters. Even a flying snake makes 150, complete with a controlled. Sorry for the abrupt end there, but yeah, 200 meters, that's more than the length of two entire football fields from a height of what, like 40, let's see, 18. And eh, from a height of like 60 feet up, it's able to go a good more than 600 feet sideways. Yeah, pretty crazy. Uh, next order we have is order Testudinata. Testudinata, and this is turtles and tortoises. So a couple things about them. First of all, bodies encased in a protective shell. And the shell is actually part of, I mean, it's 
It's made up of a bunch of bones. That's what I was going to say. Usually around 50 bones. And the shell grows with the turtle or tortoise. So it's unlike the exoskeleton of an insect where in order to grow, the insect has to shed its exoskeleton, crawl out of it basically, and then grow a new one. The shell of a turtle or tortoise grows along with it. And this order has about 300 species. The dorsal shell, so the upper shell, is called the carapace. And the ventral or lower shell is called the plastron. So the carapace and plastron are the upper and lower shells. And then uh, key difference, turtles, they usually live in or near water, whereas tortoises are usually terrestrial. They don't have to live as close to water. Oftentimes they're found in, found in drier environments, and they're usually larger. And some of them can get huge. I don't know if you've seen some of the like, giant tortoises that are at some zoos. But along that line, let's do video question number one. Number one. How old is Jonathan the tortoise? Jonathan the tortoise currently holds the world record for the oldest um, living animal. And it, he, or, I mean, we know what year he was born, but not exactly when. And so age-wise, he's either 187 or 188 years old. So either one of those will work. But if we go with the upper of those, 188 years old is Jonathan the tortoise. Again, it's video question number one. How old is Jonathan the tortoise? 188 years old. Uh, and then eyelids. So uh, turtles and tortoises also have eyelids. So an upper eyelid and lower eyelid, just like we have, but also something called a nictitating membrane. And a nictitating membrane is kind of like a horizontal transparent eyelid that it can cover its eye with this eyelid, but still be able to see through it. So that gives it protection from the environment, protection from water, for being able to close one of his eyelids to protect his eye, but still be able to see. All right, and just a little video here of this giant tortoise um, eating a watermelon, just because I thought it was interesting. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> That's it. And then finally, uh, order crocodilia. And this has actually four different types of organisms in it. They're alligators. The picture on the left, bottom left here, this is an American alligator. Uh, the second one is an American crocodile. Couple of differences. Alligators, when they close, well, so snout, alligator snout is a lot more rounded. Crocodile snout, more pointy, more narrow. And when a crocodile closes its mouth, you can still see all of its teeth, whereas alligator, uh, either all of its teeth are, are hidden from sight or its upper or lower ones, I forget. But crocodiles, you can see all of the teeth. This is a dwarf caiman, uh, so separate from alligator and crocodile, but still in order crocodilia. They grow up to, I think, a maximum length of around like 14 inches, something like that. No, four feet. Oh, I'd have to double check. Yeah, so that is uh, a dwarf caiman, and then this is an Indian gharial. And look at that snout, how narrow and long that is. Yeah. All right, so... What can we say about order crocodilia? Well, first of all, they're, they have four chambered hearts and then some parental care, as in this is the, I think the first group that we are looking at where it's common for one or both of the parents to help care for the young for a little while before the young go out on their own. And there are a total of 23 species in this group. That includes the, the caiman and gharial species. Uh, by the way, it's the American crocodiles that are a lot more aggressive and a lot more dangerous. Let's do video question number five. Number five is what digestive record do crocodiles hold among vertebrates? What digestive record do crocodiles hold among vertebrates? And the answer is most 
Acidic stomach. Most acidic stomach. Um, and the reason why is because crocodile... Well, so, first of all, by most acidic stomach, their, their stomachs are able to digest stuff like bones and hoofs. And uh, a lot of other animals could not digest something like a horse hoof. But, yep, crocodiles can't, or in general, order crocodilia. I don't know. I am speaking specifically about crocodiles here. Uh, they're able to do that because they eat animals whole sometimes. They have stuff like hoofs. And let's go ahead and do also video question number two. Number two is how much force can a crocodile jaw exert? How much force can a crocodile jaw exert? And the answer is 5,000 pounds per square inch. 5,000 pounds per square inch. Contrast that with humans. We can do about 100 pounds per square inch. Uh, a great white shark, which you usually think of as having ferocious, crazy, strong, and dangerous jaws, they can do about 500 pounds per square inch. So, in other words, uh, we could say a crocodile jaw can exert about 50 times the force that a human can, or 10 times the force that a shark can, but 5,000 pounds per square inch. What's interesting, though, is the muscles for opening their jaws are very weak, and you could just if you could just grab the snout of a crocodile and hold his jaw closed, okay, or like a thick rubber band would be enough to keep its jaw closed, and it wouldn't be able to open it because, it's, yeah, its muscles for opening its jaw are really weak. We don't have much in the way of crocodiles in our part of the country. I have a sister who lives in Tampa, and alligators especially are a lot more common where they are. And just like driving around town, I remember we were driving on our way back from uh, Cape Canaveral, the Kennedy Space Center. And yep, we're just driving around, and like there on the side of the road is like a little ditch that has a little bit of water running through. And it's like, oh, look, there's an alligator in there, kind of a thing. My sister's church had, at one point, one of the buildings, I think their main sanctuary building, uh, a sinkhole developed under it, and the building fell into the sinkhole. And then they had the area fenced off where the sinkhole was, and um, somehow in that sinkhole it was like a little bit of water, but anyway, all of a sudden there was an alligator that was living in that fenced off sinkhole. And like as they would walk by that fenced area from the parking lot to the new building, the alligator would hiss at the kids as they walked by. That's just like part of their regular life experience living in Tampa, Florida area. Uh, all right. And then finally we have order... Uh, Rhancocephalia. And this is the Tuataras. And Tuataras look a lot like lizards, but they have this, what's called the spiny dorsal crest. And that is the, that spine, those like, you know, that ridge of little spiny things that goes along there. And they're native to the New Zealand area, New Zealand and some of the islands surrounding New Zealand. And I say two or one species because traditionally they would say there are two species, but depending on where you look, it says that, well, no, this other thing that was sometimes is considered separate species is just considered the one. And so that's the two or one species, depending on how you look at it. And that is our whole bird's eye look at the reptiles. I'll see you next time.